and we are live hello everyone that is on the chat and on the replay welcome to homemaking with purpose where we bring to you the best ideas information and interviews on youtube i am denise jordan your host and on tonight's episode of homemaking with purpose we're going to talk about do you serve your home or does your home serve you? Do you serve your home or does your home serve you? That's a great question to ask. And I want you guys to be thinking about that. And while you're thinking about that, I am going to say hello to a few people in the chat and then I'm going to get into it. So I've got Sally over here. Hello, Sally. And she says, was I a nursing instructor? She looked at the books I've written. Yes, I was a nursing instructor and I did publish one that was for um, a nursing program around 1994, 95. So yeah, that was me. Hello there, Duncan, party of six. And Adrian Lynn, hello to you as well. So let's go ahead and jump into it. So my question at hand is this. Do you serve your home or does it serve you? And you may ask yourself, what is the difference? Well, if you think about what your home is, a home is a place where you or your family live, laugh, love, and grow. When your home is serving you, it provides a warm, cozy, and comfortable place in which to live. And it's a place where you may also jump off or go away from. So you'll go out to school, to work, here and there, but then you'll also come home at the end of your day and hopefully feel welcome. So it's the place that you can come home and decompress when you've been out in an uncertain world. So that's when your house is serving you. You have all of these warm, fuzzy feelings, cozy, comfortable, welcoming. You can de-stress or decompress. That's when your house is serving you. So what does it mean when you're serving your house? So if you are serving your house, it could mean that you are spending all of your time cleaning. You are feeling exhausted and overwhelmed. Maybe you're missing family events because you've got too much to do at home or you're just too tired to connect then you're serving your house instead of your house serving you. And I have to tell you guys, this whole conversation, well, it made me think about two things, but I'll get to one. This one though is really off topic, but it was, it reminds me of a, a, um, a Regency novel that I read about this house called Manderley. And it was like, the people wanted to always be at the house to serve the house. And it was like the house had some kind of a, a hold or connection to the people. And I'm digressing. But anyway, those are the things that you feel when possibly when you are serving your house instead of your house serving you. So who has felt like you're serving your house rather than the other way around, rather than the house serving you? Those of you who are alive, tell me in the chat. And for those of you who are on the replay, hello team replay, tell me in the comment section, have you ever felt like you are serving your house rather than your house serving you? And the chat is jumping over here as Walter um, Strong says, so I'm going to just take a look to see what the chat is saying right now. So we've got the usual suspects here. We've got Duncan Party of Six, We've got Deb Whitmore. Hello, hello, hello. Michelle and Stephanie and Nita B. And I'm glad all of you guys are here. 
Oh, Sally said she had me as a nursing instructor. Sally, you'll have to tell me what your name is. I can't remember right now who you might be. And then Joe is here as well. And Barbara Allen, I'm glad to have you here as well. So, so on the shoulders of giants says, I know my house is running me right now. And you know what? You don't want the house to run you. You want to run the house. We got it backwards here. But I get it. Some days, as the old folks say, some days it bees that way. But we don't want it to be that way too often. Deb Whitmore says both. She's serving the house and the house serves her. So boom, Deb, I want to hear more about that. What do you mean by that? And now that you say that, I can kind of see it. I'm going to back up for a second. I'm just going to back up for a second just because I can do that. And um, ask, and again, when we talk about what the house should be, the house should be a home, and we know what a home is, and then a place to feel comfortable in, to return to, to decompress, that kind of thing. That's when the house is serving you. It's not a place of stress. But if you're serving the house, you're spending all your time cleaning, feeling exhausted, overwhelmed, and you're missing out on stuff. So that's the kind of the difference there. But what I find interesting is that Deb would say both. And since Deb says that, I can kind of see it, Deb. But I'm going to let you tell me what you mean by that first. So Barb says she loves her home and there is no place she'd rather be than home where she feels the most love. And yes, that is where you should feel the most love, the most cared for, the most comfortable. At home is where you can just be yourself. And as we used to say, let it all hang out and it just be okay. Now, Nefertiri says, glad she caught me live tonight. And Nefertiri, I am glad that you are here too. She says that she and her home definitely serve each other. And I like that, Nefertiri. You know, guys, sometimes when I'm preparing the notes for these sessions, sometimes I'll kind of be off on one track, but I kind of get tunnel vision. And Nefertiri, you are absolutely right in that you and the house serve each other. However, the house should not be a stressor. I heard earlier today when I was looking at a, a video by Joshua Becker that a quote from Peter Walsh says that your home should not be a place of stress. It should not add to the stress in your life. And it should not. It should be a, a place where you are comfortable and de-stressing and not adding to your stress. So Duncan, party of six, and you know, I forgot your name. I'm just getting terrible at remembering people's names. But Duncan Party of Six says that she's definitely in the serving your house season. I tell you, I'm kind of like that this week because I've got this little pockets of chaos just kind of all over the house this week. So Miss Higga House says she's serving her house. And Barbara says she puts in work, but her home definitely serves her well, and she loves it. I like that. I like that. So um, Stephanie says yes. Joe says her house serves her. And that's for the most part we want it to be. And hey, there's my little sister, Jerry Barber. Miss Jones, hello. And then Nita B says, my house serves me, but I respect my house. And again, boom, I like that too. The house serves me, but I give the house the love and the respect it deserves so that it does serve me. Now, let me ask this question then, uh, and I'm going to ask the question and just throw it out there and anyone can jump in. But so Nita B says the house serves her, but she respects the house. So how can we respect the house so that it does serve us? Tell me that if you're on the uh, replay leave me a comment. But if you're here tonight, ladies and gents, I want to see your comments right here. So
So Miss Higginhouse, and tell us your name. I for, I know you've been here with us before and I've forgotten it. I'm just not doing well the last couple of weeks with names. But you say, how do I get to the place of no stress? I feel like every time I turn around, I see something that needs to be done. Miss Higginhouse, you get to the place of no stress when you've got your routines to a point that you get up in the morning and just boom, you just get them started. You get up, you do your exercise or your meditation or whatever it is you do as part of your morning routine. You get your family up, you get them cared for, get them out the door. And then you get that daily routine started, which is for me is a daily swish and swipe, a load of laundry, unload the dishwasher, fix the hubby his cup of tea, make breakfast, and then get him up in his studio working on his new bugs. And then I can get to doing any weekly um, work that I'm doing in the house, which is my zone work, my 15 minute zones. And the beauty of this is once you get your routines down, you'll get to the point where you're cleaning a clean house. You'll be like, well, gosh, the house is already clean. What do I need to do? And you'll be thinking of things that you need to do. It does come. It does come. But this is something that I was not going to talk about tonight. But I, well, I won't talk about it tonight. I'm, I'm making myself notes to talk about it another time. But okay. But it does come. Okay. Now, see, Nefertiri, there you go. I wasn't going to talk about it tonight. And so you say you have a Marie Kondo relationship with your home. You love serving it in a way that makes it best serve your family. And if you're not enjoying an aspect of your home, that aspect must go. You are coexisting. Nefertiri, boom, I love that as well. I absolutely love that. And you know, that kind of makes me think of, of Angel on Habits of a Homemaker. This is the way she thinks a lot of times. She talks about, you know, the service to your home and your family. And so I love this. You love serving it in a way that makes it best serve your family. And how can we best do that? So I'm going to back up for one second to uh, Higa House. Tell us your name because I, I don't remember what it is. But and when we talked about how can you get to that place, I said, when you'll get to your routines. And then when you say every time you turn around, you see something that needs done, you're going to address those things in one of two ways. You're either going to say, oh, it's time for me to do my uh, clutter stops. And so when you do your clutter stop, which is like a quick five minute tidy up, which you do after breakfast, after lunch, and then after dinner or rather before bed, unless you're a payroll homemaker, which means you work outside the home. So you do a clutter stop before you leave for work, right when you come in from work. And then um, before you put your family to bed for the night, you'll do a clutter stop then, which is a quick tidy up. It's not that you're doing a whole bunch of cleaning, but if some of the little minions, as Fly Lady Cat calls them, have been gotten out of place, people have pulled some things out and left them, we put them back into their places. That's what we do at our clutter stops. And if you need to do another little tidy up, you could do that then. But you eventually find yourself cleaning a clean house. Now, I'm going to come back over here. Uh, I think I'm missing something. Oh, so then when Nefertiri said she's got the Marie Kondo relationship with her home, she serves it in a way that makes it best for her family. And then Stephanie is still trying to get her house put together. Well, Stephanie just moved recently into a new house. So not like it's brand new, brand new, just built, but it's new house, a new house to her. And you know what it's like when you move into a new house. It's going to take you time to one, unpack. Number two, to live in the space so that you see how it flows and what you like. And then you'll want to start to get it decorated and things like that. So yeah, it's going to take you a little bit of time, Stephanie. And I think one of the girls made the comment to you last week that said, don't stress yourself. Remember, this new space, which you moved into, is to serve you and your hubby. 
So take the time to figure out how you and your hubby best want to feel in that space and gradually kit out the smaller spaces one step at a time so that it serves you. Um, so Deb says there are days when she's serving her home, but it's done with love. She works full time from home and she's a full time caregiver, which does make things exhausting. Now, Deb, I am puzzled right here because and I, I could just be off a little bit. But when you say you work full time from home, does that mean you have a payroll job? that you work full time, but you do it from home. You have a remote position that pays you to work full time from home, or you mean that you're full, you're a full time homemaker because, you know, we're always full time homemakers, whether we stay at home all day or not. Because if somebody calls you and you're at work, you're going to have to leave work to come and do whatever is necessary for your family. So, but does that mean that you work in the home, you're a stay at home homemaker plus a full time caregiver? answer me that but i'm thinking that that's what that is that you're a caregiver plus you're a full-time homemaker within the home but yeah i get it but it can be exhausting at times even when you don't have all that going on hey adrian i saw your comment you left me earlier and your house is serving you all the time because you have been spring cleaning well all right then you've been spring cleaning and your house is definitely serving you i like it so Barbara says she has daily tasks, but she's also a spontaneous cleaner as well and can get a lot accomplished in a small block of time. Sometimes you can't plan every detail of your house, but you do the best you can. And yes, you're right, Barb. You can't plan every detail. And I think I forgot to say to uh, Higa Home earlier is that one part of that is that you're going to have your routines down. But the other part is that you'll see some things that are out of place and you'll say, as Fly Lady Cat has taught me to say, I see you and I have a plan for you. Because if you're in the middle of something and then you turn around, it's like, oh, I really need to clean up that corner there. And you stop and go address that. You'll never get one whole big thing done and you'll feel stressed and stretched. So you'll want to try to accomplish the task that you set out to. And whatever the additional thing you see that needs to be done, you'll put it on your to-do list and have it. Uh, do it either the next day or the next time that particular zone comes around. Uh, Nefertiri says, respecting your home is about living within your abilities. Now, I think Nefertiri has said something huge right there, which is living within your abilities. If you don't like to clean, practice minimalism, which means that if you don't like to clean, then you want to have less stuff because the less stuff you have, the easier it is to clean your home, to dust things and that kind of thing. If you don't enjoy cooking daily, then batch cook. If you love family time, then limit how much TV, uh -huh, how many TVs you have. Girl, I hear that too. So yes. So yeah, so there's some things you just have to think about and things you just have to work out. And then Rain says, with having young children, I found that cleaning, picking up once they are down for naps and bedtime helps her to keep their home clean. And yes, when you have young children, when you uh, put them down for their nap, you pick up after them, and then again, that tidy up at bedtime. And depending upon how old they are, like if they're like able to walk around a little bit, they can help you start to pick up. I used to watch my sister um, she has a home daycare and I would go over to visit her sometimes for whatever reason. Because, And trust me, I wouldn't stay long. But when it was time to clean things up, she would start singing this song. Clean up, clean up. Everybody cleans up. And they'd be walking around picking up toys and putting them in the toy box. And the children would be helping. So get your children involved in helping you as soon as they are able. Okay. So Joe says she has a schedule, but she also allows things to not happen if she doesn't feel well that day. So Joe um, talks about sometimes her health has her in a situation 
where she just can't get done what she wants to get done. And she gives herself the grace to say, it's okay. Today, it's not happening. And that's the thing that I tell my uh, homemakers as well, is that when you have to not do whatever you have to not do, you just step back into your routine when you're able to get back at it. And if you've been working your routines all along, just step back in where you are and it just makes things go a little easier. Let's see. Okay, yes, yeah, what I thought, Deb. So you work remotely. So you got a full-time job working remotely and you're also a full-time caregiver for your husband. So whoever it is that you're working for, they're expecting you to put in your 40 hours a week working for them. And then you've also got the additional uh, duties of helping your um, your disabled husband. So I understand it can't be difficult. So Nina's here. Sue is here. So yes, hello, everyone. Okay, let me get back on track. I've been chatting up a bit and I did not intend to chat quite so much. So we just talked about who's felt like you're serving the house instead of the house serving you. That was an interesting discussion right there. So before I get too much further, let me just say that this episode of Homemaking with Purpose is brought to you by Homemaking 201, Mastering Your Homemaking Journey, which is our eight-week mentoring program. And it will help you master your homemaking journey. And notice I say your, not mine, but yours. And it can make the perfect gift for young homemakers, new brides, and even seasoned homemakers needing to tweak. We're only going to take a small group this first time we work through it. So please check us out at www.aprendiva.com. And let me show you how you can find it. Uh, I think I'm needing new glasses. So here's my website, aprendiva.com. And you can see where our new spring aprons are up, this cute little cottontail. But then here is our course, Homemaking 201. And you can see it's for all homemakers. And um, as I said, it's an eight-week program that helps you master your homemaking journey. You can see the cost here and you can um, pay for it on Shopify. So I put it on my Shopify cart because there's already a method for you to put in uh, to, for it to take payments. And Shopify has a number of different ways for you to do that. So Shopify, Shopify Plus, PayPal, and other things. So check it out because I would not want cost to be a barrier for those that need it. And as I said earlier, it could be a perfect gift for a young homemaker or a new bride. Okay, so now, where am I? So I got the idea for this particular topic from Joshua Becker. He is a minimalist and he did a video recently about 15 little changes you can make in your home to help it serve you better. And I will just show you um, him just real quick. I'm not going to go through the um, video because, of course, um, this is Joshua Becker, and then here is the title, 15 Little Changes You Can Make in Your Home to Help It Serve You Better. And I will link this in the description box. But when I listened to that video, like I said, he's a minimalist. I am not a minimalist. I am not pretending to be a minimalist. I am not even minimalish, but I got a lot of stuff. And I'm definitely a woman of a certain age and I need to be getting rid of uh, some of it. And that's what I've been doing. So every now and then I'll listen to some of the minimalists to get some ideas about getting rid of some of my stuff. And he was the one that asked the question about whether or not you're serving your home and, or is your home serving you. And then um, he gave ideas for the 15 changes that you can make to um, make sure that your home is serving you. So change number one, which I thought was very interesting, was declutter. Change number one is declutter. And we know that to get your house to the place you want it to be, 
decluttering is always the first step because as Fly Lady Cat says, you cannot organize clutter. That's number one, like boom, you cannot organize clutter. And when he talked about decluttering and he had like 15 different things and the decluttering was in several of them. So I kind of lumped a few things together, but he talked about decluttering decor. And I thought about that. I thought, what a good idea. He talked about decor that you no longer like, you no longer care for, that just no longer serves you. And I have a paint, well, I had a painting on the wall down in our living room that I absolutely hated. My sister-in-law gave it to my husband, who is her brother, and he loved it. And he hung it in the living room, and I've hated that picture ever since. I just didn't feel like it was appropriate for our living room. I won't say it didn't go with the couch because the colors were similar, but there was just something about the picture that I didn't like. And when we had the house repainted or either that or I took some things down for Christmas, I just didn't put that painting back up. And when I declutter some of those things, that picture is going to the Goodwill. At least I have to figure out how to get it out to the Goodwill. Then again, maybe I should because it's not my picture. It's my husband's picture. And you know you're not supposed to declutter anybody else's stuff. But you can at least change it. So right now it's on the floor behind the sofa where I have a lot of other pictures that we are not hanging right now. My husband's a retired art teacher. So we've got lots of paintings around here. And I can't possibly hang them all. We could have it be an art gallery, which we are on some days. So that's why I've got pictures behind the sofa. But... He talked about decluttering decor. And uh, for those of you that just watched my last video, uh, my Tiny Tidy Tuesday, where I decluttered the flowers in my craft room, I also decluttered some other decor. But that was a, those were a lot of things that I had in there. But decor, knickknacks, collections. Maybe you have collections of things that you no longer like to display or no longer want to keep. The other biggie is clothing decluttering clothing that no longer serves you. And when you think about clothing, um, sometimes clothing is guilty clutter or not guilty clutter. Kaz at the clutter bug calls clothing that doesn't fit bullies because when you see them in your closet, you're thinking, well, when I lose weight, I'm going to wear that or I'm going to exercise and I'm going to lose my belly and I'm going to wear that. And then there's guilty clutter which is gifts or things that people have given you that no longer serve you. So there are those things there. So there's that. So, and then I think we alluded to one of our shows and it could have been the one last week when we talked about how to fall back in love with your home, where we talked about getting rid of things that you don't like or things that might be uh, associated with bad memories um, or uncomfortable feelings. And so there were some things that I had just kind of put away in a trunk because I didn't want to look at them because they caused bad feelings, but I didn't want to dispose of them. But now, you know, I've got the courage to say, I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of those things because I know that seeing them will bring back the bad memories or the uncomfortable feelings. So you don't have to keep those things. And as far as a guilty clutter, if someone gave you a gift, you used it, even if you only used it for a day, now that you've used it, it's, and you don't, you no longer want it to serve you, then you can let it serve someone else. Or if it's a gift from a relative that you know is going to come looking to see where do you have it when they come, put it away in a box up in a closet until they come to visit. And when you know they're coming, get it out, set it out and put it away when they go away. I know that seems a little dishonest. However, if you don't want to hurt their feelings, you can do it that way. Otherwise, you're causing stress to yourself by having things out all the time that you don't like. And sometimes when you get rid of those things that have bad feelings associated with them or things that you don't like, it can just kind of lift some of the darkness, lift some of the gloom that you may be experiencing. Okay. And, and like I said, I can attest to this that sometimes there are things that just put a pall over your spirit and getting rid of them can lift that. And um, 
I've just decided that I'm no longer going to be held hostage by some of these pieces. And you can do the same. Don't allow yourself to be held hostage by some of those things. Let's see real quick. Okay, so Terry Ruiz, hey there, I'm glad to see you with us. She says she's here early for a change. So Nita B says when she does her deep cleaning, she puts some music so loud and she gets busy and then time seems to fly and she gets a lot done. And that is a good way to serve your home, get those things done, and then you can move on to something else because you're not meant to spend all day cleaning. You're meant to spend maybe an hour in your cleaning and then the rest of the other stuff might be some kind of maintenance or other things that you need to do. And then Nina says she focuses on one room at a time for the duration of a podcast. And so before she knows it, she's listened to something meaningful and got some meaningful work done in her home. I like that. I do. I like that. Yes. Yeah, so Nefertiti is laughing at me. Minimalish. I am not minimalish. I am probably a maximalist, but I'm trying to get rid of stuff. So I'm getting down there. Um, so Rain says unnecessary mail tends to pile up until she gets tired of looking at it and then she shreds it. So that's one way she declutters and the counter looks so clean afterwards. So Rain, then one of the things that you want to do again is make that, that paper there, those piles as part of your daily routine. So as part of your daily routine, in addition to the dishwasher, the laundry, the swish and swipe, cleaning up after breakfast, because I think you're a stay-at-home mom. When you do your clutter stop, if there's any papers or piles that are starting on the kitchen counter, handle them so they're not there. You don't want to see them there. Because I tell you what, once you get used to, once you've got your after breakfast dishes put away, then you just kind of stand there and you look around at your spots where things tend to clutter. And I know like in my kitchen, it can be my counter or the little railing between the dining room and the family room and see if there's anything there that's not where it should be. If it is, just pick it up and put it where it goes. No more minimum. Is there such a thing as a maximalist? Yes, there, there he is. So Sally says the way she views it is that she's gotten joy out of it. Yes, now it's time to let it go to someone else that can enjoy it. I got rid of a lot of Christmas decor this year, just a lot. I promised my husband that when he got all the bins down, that he would not have to put up as many back in the attic. And he did not. I, we got rid of quite a few things that I just didn't use this year. Um. Terry says she's offered items to younger relatives who have admired them. Some of them are thrilled to receive such things as unexpected gifts. Yes. So, Terry, that's one of the things that I've been doing as I work on Swedish death cleaning. And me and Organized by Darcy have been working on Swedish death cleaning because both of us have been married more than 40 years. I've been married 50 years and she's been like somewhere around 45. You can accumulate a lot of stuff in all that time. And one of my viewers, and I can't remember now who it was, but helped me to realize that I no longer have to be the one to give the tea parties and the baby showers and do all of that. We have younger women in the family that can do that. So I don't need to keep a lot of the fancy little plates, like the little luncheon sets and those kind of things anymore. And my daughter lives in Memphis and we're here in Indiana. So you know, I've sent some things to her, but there are some things that she just doesn't want or need. I mean, she's got her own house. She's been married almost 20 years, so she's got her own stuff. But I've got a new sister-in-law who has got a house full of stuff herself, but she's still acquiring some things. 
And so I offered her those little luncheon sets and she thought they were beautiful and she loved them. And so I gave them to her because she's giving like little parties and teas and those kinds of things right now. She's in that stage of her life where I'm past it. I'll go and sit and drink a cup of tea, but I don't have to host it anymore. So, and that was part of my fantasy self and my real self coming to grips that my real self is like, you know what? You don't have to do that anymore. So thanks to whoever reminded me of that. Oh, Blue Skies. Hey, Blue Skies. How you doing? I'm glad you're here. Uh, oh, yes. Um, Nefertiri is telling Rain, don't bring in any trash mail. All of your important mail, open it immediately, then file it once you pay it, once you paid it or put eyes on it. If you have to address it, take a picture of it with your sale. But Trash, circulars, throw them in the trash. My husband threw some stuff away, and part of it, I thought, was my Kroger digital coupons, but it wasn't, because I looked in the trash to see what he had put in there. Okay. Uh, oh, don't worry about typos. I cannot type a lick when I'm typing on the screen. Okay, so we're... Just to um, remind people of those who joined us late, we are talking about whether or not you serve your home or your home serves you. And what are ways that you can make sure that the home is serving you? Then a couple of people talked about, well, I serve my home and it serves me. It's a collaboration or, you know, it's a service of love. And I thought, yeah, that makes sense, too. So we're having some good discussions in that regard. So now let's just take a look at his second topic, which again was when I say second one, I'll say the second point I want to make because he had a list of 15, but the clutter in different spaces was probably about five or six of them. So he and the he is Joshua Becker, and I will link his channel in the description box below with the um uh, title of the video, but he also talked about decluttering in your cabinets and your drawers. These are what I call your hidden spaces, your closets, your drawers, your cabinets, bins with lids, those kinds of things. Those are your hidden spaces and they are often overly full. And then when these spaces become full and you have to put some things away, you are trying to do laundry, you hesitate to put things away because there's no place to put them. Maybe you're having to stuff them or cram them in. And that is no fun. And it is uncomfortable. And for me, when I decluttered in my master bedroom closet, I felt so much better because uh, the first thing I did was I decluttered everything out that no longer served me. If it was didn't fit me right now, I put it in the donate bin because I didn't want it to bully me thinking, well, if I lose 10 pounds, I can squeeze into this or that. Or if I put it on, I stand in front of the mirror and I feel like I look like a sausage. No, I just went ahead and decluttered those things. If it didn't fit right now, then it no longer suited me. Then I removed all of the seasonal items by placing them in white garment bags. And I put them at the end of my closet so that I didn't have to look at what is in them. So now this is what I mean. And I got one back here. I brought one in to show you. So let me. So this is a white garment bag, and I've got about three of these. I just picked it up at Walmart. It was like less than $4. And this is the back of the bag. Well, this is the front of the bag. And look how brightly colored that is. But what I do is I put, I put those seasonal items at the back of the closet, just push them all the way to the back. And then all I see maybe is just this. So it reduces the visual clutter. It reduces the visual clutter so that I'm not bothered with all the drama of all the clothes that are in there. And see, those are clothes that are spring and summer. Now, I'll be getting those things out pretty soon. 
Well, maybe not because a lot of, well, yeah, those that yellow and green, those are my sorority things. And um, so I'll be getting those out and then I'll be putting the winter things though in those garment bags so that I'm not looking at those. And then I reorganize the closet so that I can see what's in there. There's a lot fewer things in there since I got rid of things that didn't fit, that no longer suited, that were seasonal. Now I've got space for the things that I do love, use, and wear. And I'm not like crammed in there trying to find something. I can find what I need easily so it doesn't take me long to, uh, to get dressed in the morning. It just all works together. And I feel so less stressed since it's easy to take care of what I need in that closet. So the closet is serving me now rather than me serving it when I had all those things packed in there and I could barely find what I was looking for. And like I said, I had lots of stress and anxiety as a result of trying to manage all the stuff because everything that was in there, I had to manage, meaning that I either had to push it and move it aside while I looked for something else. I had to pick it up off the floor if it fell off the hanger because there was too much stuff in there. Or I had to try to put things up on a shelf or get things down. So when I had too much stuff in there, I had to manage it. Stressful. Now, one argument that I always hear, and let me get this back up. One argument that I always hear is that I pay good money for that. And let's see, is that next? Yeah, people will say, I pay good money for that. When I lose weight, I'll be able to get back into it. Or it's still good, so I really don't want to, to discard it yet. Or it won't be treasured. Now, you guys are going to laugh at this because there were a few things that I was going to donate. And they were some of my like fancier dishes. And I didn't want to take them to a Goodwill or I didn't want to take them to the Salvation Army. I wanted to take them to the Goodwill and I wanted to take it to a particular thrift shop, even not the Goodwill, but to the Dove's Nest because they really handled their nice, fancy dishes very well. Like going into their, they called it their legacy shop, but it was where they kept their china and all that stuff. It was like going into Macy's the way they had it displayed. It was just so lovely. So I wanted to take my really good place out there. But my husband was like, what difference does it make where you take it? It's going to go to whoever needs it. But I felt like, well, I think it'll be treasured more if it's like over here. He said, what? So you think people that live over in this area don't deserve good things? And I was like, oh, you're right. But I just wanted to make sure that they were treasured. And then I'm like, what, what am I saying? I'm giving it away. I'm donating it. So what difference does it make? who takes it in and whoever buys it is buying it for the reason that they want it. They want to use it. So let me ask you guys then. I'm stressed when, and you finished the sentence. I was stressed when my closets were jam packed and I couldn't figure out what to wear because I couldn't find anything. And I definitely wasn't being served because I was stressed. So now you finish that sentence. I'm stressed when, when you're trying to get your house to serve you or when you're serving your house and it's not serving you. Finish that sentence for me. I'm stressed when. Okay. Sprinkled and painted. Hey there. Let's see. I got a lot of new people on. Hey there. Hey, Kadia. Glad to have you there. So Garden Girl says, what do you do with the in-between trash giveaways? Oh, personalized items, small dollar store items. Well, if it's either or, it's either trash or it's donate. If it's something that's been personalized and you have concerns about that, then what you could do is put a label over the the personal the name or the personalization piece, something like that, 
And depending upon what it looks like, you may or may not be able to, you know, tear out. It depends upon what it's like too, because if it needs to have the um, the fly leaf or something torn out, you can do that. But if it's just like to Denise from Mama, I don't see any see why that's too bad to have. So you could just leave that like that. Um, but if it's something that is really inexpensive, something that came from like the dollar store and you really don't think it's worth very much, just, just discard it. Uh, because the Goodwill or Salvation Army, they don't want you to send them their trash either. They really don't. Okay. Let's see. The master cloud, the master claw that looks pretty good. So sprinkled and painted said she's been decluttering and organizing for two days. She's on a break watching. And you know, sprinkled and painted, tell us your name. We like to know each other's names. That's a good idea. I'm gonna have to open this door because it is hot. I think it's getting hot in here with me having that door closed. But yes, um, you are entitled to a break. You only have to do four work four days a week, Monday to Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So yeah, take that break. I have my break on Tuesday, but you might need to take yours on another day. Um oh, and Joe says any gar any item can be decluttered or donated, even if it's been personalized. Yes, because I remember once I sold a uh, sweatshirt at a garage sale and it had the name Jason on it. One of my son's name was Jason. It was for a toddler. Well, the lady that bought it at the garage sale, she had a, a son named Jason. So she was glad to get that for her baby with the name already on it. Deladzu is here. Hey there. So Blue Skies is planning out her spring projects. Uh, But how do you know if it's throw away or give it away? You have to make that decision. If you think it's worth being used by someone else, it's not bro it's not broken, torn. Um, if it's usable and you think someone else can use it, then give it away. Put it in the donate bin. But if it's trash, if it's something that you don't want to use yourself, not because it's um because you don't like it, but just because uh, it's broken or something, then pitch it. If it's broken at all, discard it because you don't want to donate broken things. But if it's something that you feel like, okay, I don't want to use this anymore, but someone else might, then you go ahead and uh, donate that. You guys are talking to each other. Joe says, if it's in good condition, I donate it. If it's stained or beat up, I trash it. And I, that's a good way to explain it, Joe. So sprinkled and painted talks about the sunk cost. She's had to work on that herself. So when she talks about the sunk cost, that means the money you've already sunk into the item. But here's the thing, you've already spent the money. You've already used the item or not used the item. So you either got your money out of it or you didn't, but you're not gonna get any more out of it now. So you might as well go ahead and donate it so it can free up some space so that you can have space for the things that you do want, need and love. And then Joe says, if a book is personalized, she will black it out um, with a, a marker and then donate it. Nefertiri says, looking at her quarantine closet has been stressing her out. She's currently selling all the pandemic shopping that she did on Poshmark. So she can get some of her money back, but the items truly had to go. And yeah, you can get some of the money back if you do Poshmark. But uh, unless you're doing that, then like for me, it was easier just to go ahead and donate. It's like, I don't want to be bothered with anything like that. I'd rather just take it.
Now, painted and sprinkled, that's a good idea. She's doing a de-stash and selling craft bundles and then doing some donating. I like that idea. And places that enjoy those kind of things that you're donating, women's shelters, boys and girls clubs, and different places like that. But definitely women's shelters because it's a place for them to be able to use some of those craft items without them having to invest their own money in it. Oh. And see, Jerry, I agree. Jerry says she stressed when the closets are too full to fit anything else in. And that was one of the big stressors for me when the closets are jam packed. And then I can't figure out what to wear and I'm not being served. So, yeah, that that's a problem. So one of the things that um, Joshua Becker talked about was to count the cost of the clutter and those things that are taking up space are costing you stress because you have to manage them so that's the cost of the clutter it feels good to let things go so they can serve others and one of the things that i did when i was clearing out my master bedroom closet i had some a wool, white wool cardigans, some old blazers and jackets and things like that. I sent pictures of those to my daughter and my granddaughter to see if they were interested. And they wanted them, especially my granddaughter. She loves vintage items. I mean, they go thrifting for stuff, especially my granddaughter. She loves to go thrifting. She's a freshman at uh, Spelman College now, but she still loves to go thrifting. And I thought, some of those things she's thrifting for, finding vintage items. Well, I got like vintage stuff in my closet. And so I even spotted her in a picture with one of the jackets on that um, she had gotten from me uh, last year. So I was able to offer things to them by sending them the picture and then them get making the choice or the decision as to whether they wanted them or not. Because there were some things that said, nah, no, thank you. Or thanks, Grand, but no, thank you. And those things I just went ahead and donated to um, the Goodwill or the Salvation Army. But you do want to consider the cost of the clutter. And the cost of the clutter is the anxiety or the stress that you feel when you are stressed. Okay, so let's get up here and we did that one. And we are, we're talking about the cost of the clutter right now. And as I mentioned earlier, there is stress. You can feel stressed related to managing the items. And then also there's anxiety. And then there's also a lot of shame associated with messiness, chaos, and, and too much stuff. So there is that as well. So one of the things that I want to ask you about is how do you feel when you've got a lot of clutter? The question is, is it because you don't have enough um, places to put it in? That's the question I have for you right now. So, like I said, I feel better when I'm able to get some things put away. But my next question is, when you can't get them put away, what's the reason for it? Is it because you have too many things and they won't fit into that space? Or is it because... Um, the space that you have to put them in is too small. And I think about when I decluttered in my kitchen cabinets, and if you guys, hopefully you guys saw my 15-minute um, kitchen cleaning marathon where I stitched together uh, several videos that showed you a month's worth of kitchen cleaning tasks, 15-minute tasks. Um. I felt really good getting those different things done. So tell me in the chat, if you're here live or on the replay, if your home has a lot of clutter, what is the problem? Is it that you don't have a space to put it in 
or the space that it should go in is already full or you just have too many things. Let's talk about that. The chat is quieting down now. Let's see. So I'm getting, that's blue sky sending me things that I need to put up. So I got to find them. Oh, let me find sprinkled and painted. So, um, Blue Sky sent me a note from Sprinkled and Painted that says, so fun to see you live, finding you through Think Media. Oh, thank you. What Think Media did you see me on? Type it in there so I can go look at it. I'm just curious, but I'm glad that you're here. Thank you. Okay. So the question though remains, why do you have a problem with clutter? Do you have too much stuff? Is there no place for you to put it? Or is the place where it goes already full with other stuff? So let me see what the chat's got to say about that. Oh, there's where Sprinkled and Painted, she said, fun to see me live. And she found me through Think Media. Tell me where the video is that you found me on. And... So Barbara says that the closet declutter video inspired her. She plans to clean out her hall closet and donate old coats. Yes. And, you know, right now it, I decluttered my closet earlier in the winter because we have really bad winters here. And so it's important that if you're going to donate coats, donate them early so people can get them and have them for winter season. Um. Old tiles and things, people like those at um, animal shelters. Um, Blue Sky said you can put a book plate over the personalization. Uh, let's see what else. Poshmark, Play-Doh's Closet, and Clothes Mentor. Those are good places to, those are more like consignment shops. And you can get money back on your thing. So that's a good thing to do as well. Um, Let's see. Yes, it sets you free to declutter. So Daluzu said, where, where is she? There she is. So Daluzu says that she's in Kenya and they love buying secondhand decor they find in thrift markets. The items comes in from America and Europe. It's cheaper and better quality to what they can get new from China. And yeah, and let me tell you guys a little piece of trivia that I just learned. And it was um, regarding the Super Bowl. So, you know, when the Super Bowl comes, there's two teams and only one team wins. But they have the T-shirts or the gear for both teams already made. So regardless of who wins, they've got all this gear already. But then the team that has lost, they can't sell those shirts. So they donate those shirts to other countries and their good quality material and then they that's why you'll see some people in other countries wearing like super bowl shirts and stuff like that because they've been donated as a result of say the nfl donates the the losing team's gear so i just thought that was kind of interesting but yeah so that loops in you guys like the thrift shop too my granddaughters love thrifting Terry says she's got a small closet, so she has to change things out when the season comes and eliminate as much as possible. And you know, that's what I did too. And the funny thing is, Terry, the closet that is mine, that is all mine, it's like, you know, it's a big closet that you find in a regular size bedroom. It's a big closet you with bifold doors. And when we moved into this house, our three children were still living here at the time. So when we moved in, one son was in this room. It was his bedroom. Another son was across the hall. Daughter was in what I now call the guest room. And then we were in a bedroom. And he and I kept all of our clothes in our bedroom in the two closets in that room. One closet was the little 36-inch closet that you find in all houses and even in old houses. And I put my scrubs and dresses in there. And then the master closet we shared. I had half the closet on this end where I hung dresses and pants and things. He had the other half of the closet that had 
double hung rods and he hung his suits and coats and shirts and jackets and ties and all that. So the two of us shared that one closet. Now it's just me in that closet and I had it full and he has his clothes in, um, in his art studio across the hall full of stuff. So I asked him one day, I said, now when we moved in here, all of our stuff fit in this room. Now we've got stuff that has expanded into the spaces we had to put it in. And we didn't have as much stuff then. We didn't have as much space. So we didn't buy as much stuff. And then every year when school started, he regularly decluttered his closet because, you know, stuff didn't fit or new things or whatever. So when I decluttered this closet, I, like I said, I took out the seasonal items and I put them in dress ba garment bags like that that's hanging behind the door. And then also some small, some little bins that you could either put under the bed, but I folded them up and put them on top of the shelf in the closet. So seasonal items are handled like that. So Sally's been off with a back injury. Okay, you guys are talking to each other. That's good. Uh, Barbara said she's learned to let go. She used to become emotionally attached to certain items and wouldn't throw it away, but she's grown to donate, give away, or throw away items when it's time to move on. And that's the same thing that I had to learn too, Barbara, is that the memories are not that thing. And that thing is not the person. The memories that those things inspire, they're up here. So I can let those things go and remember the memories associated with various things. So Miss Jones says she's moved to a temporary spot and doesn't want to let some things go. You know, Miss Jones, I understand that when you're in a temporary home, you keep things around you that are comforting and that are more permanent. So it's OK. Don't worry about. Um, well, I wouldn't say I wouldn't worry about some of the things that you keep, but you still can't keep too much. If they're important to you and they help you feel safe and comfortable and cozy in your temporary home, then it's OK. But they've got to fit in the space you have to keep them in. So you just got to think about it like that. Uh, yeah, thrifted clothes do last longer. And uh, Dalitzu said you can also get designer shoes and clothes that way as well. Jerry says she thinks that she has too many things. She recently moved from a three bedroom house to a two bedroom apartment. She's gotten rid of lots of things, but she still has so much stuff and so little places to put them in. Jerry, you probably didn't downsize enough when you moved. And that is very, very difficult. If you went from a three bedroom house to a two bedroom apartment, you significantly reduced the amount of space that you have. So the question is, did you significantly reduce your stuff? And that's what you're going to want to work on. And so as I talk about the spring in the clean challenge that's coming up in just a little bit, maybe you could start that challenge in the kitchen or maybe you might need to start it in another room. You can decide that when I come to it. Oh, OK. I know which one you're talking about. All right. Good. Oh, Kadia, was it the video where I did the um, the 15 minute decluttering sessions in the kitchen or was it just the one where I did the flowers? And so Kadia says she's got too many things and her storage space is small. You know what? That's a problem that we have in this country. We have so much stuff. Then we end up getting more storage to store the stuff and then places outside the house to store the stuff. But we just have to try to do with less to make it fit in the space we have. Like Danny K. White says, is to use the container concept and think of our house as a container and the rooms as a container and the things we have have to fit in the container or the space we have to keep it in.
So Duncan says she has to stay on top of the twins' clothes as they grow because it can quickly get out of hand. So, you know, as the babies grow and their clothes um, get too small, pack those away. When you're doing laundry, get those packed away, put them in a box and set them aside because you're still in your childbearing uh, age. So I don't know if you're going to have more children or not. So you may need to save those or set them aside, or you may have family members you want to give those to. Oh, okay. So Sally said she was off with a back injury in the first three weeks. She didn't move much when she started. Now she's like sorting papers and books, things that she can do simply and easily. Deb says she has some spaces that are dual purposes, like her workspace is her craft space and they aren't getting along as roommates. I understand completely Deb, because my craft space, you know, my craft room is also my guest room. So when guests come to visit, that's where they sleep in that room. So I had to get that sorted out. So that's why I had to get rid of all those flowers that were up there. So Anita B said most of her clutter, she doesn't need and she doesn't have room for. Deb says she did a challenge letting go of old clothes that her children have used. She gets attached to them. I understand that too. Oh, thank you. Sprinkled and painted. Again, tell us your name. I, I, we need to hear that. Yes. Napateri says her 15-year-old daughter said most people only wear 20% of their clothes 100% of the time. And you know what? She's probably right. So Napateri has revisited the capsule wardrobe, which she had practiced for decades until she just stopped doing that. It makes sense. I agree. Because even when I downsized my closet and kind of redid everything, I still only wear a few things that's in there. Yeah, we filled up the clothes, the closet with things once the kids left. It's just crazy. Okay, sprinkled and painted Kelly. Her name is Kelly. So Terry says that her comfort level for how much to keep has definitely changed. And yes, time for less. And I agree. And I'll tell you what. Darcy had organized by Darcy and myself. We had talked about all this stuff we have and our kids don't want our stuff. So as we look at when the inevitable eventually happens, someone's going to have to come in here and clear all this stuff out. Now, my kids aren't going to want most of it. And like I was in here, I had dropped something on the floor and I was looking for it. And look what I found here under my desk. A Campbell's Super Recipes. It's like a little vintage tin and I ordered it from Campbell's years ago and I kept recipes in it. Well, I don't have recipes in it now. Why is it up here in my office and why is it under my desk? I don't know. So would I clean the office next when zone three comes around and I work in this space? I think I'm going to donate it. And I was like, do you really want to donate that? Justin used to like that. I'm like, you know what? Justin could care less. That's going to go. Okay. <laughs> Duncan Party of Six, tell me your name because you know I forgot. But you said no more kids. These four are enough. However, she does put away some of the older kids' things for the younger two that she loves and are gently using. Well, do that. Then put aside some of the younger kids, the older kids' stuff for the younger ones. And then um, you're in that um, generation or that age group where you'll have friends who are having babies and showers and things. So you'll have friends that you can probably pass some of those things on to or um, or um, donate them. And, you know, I was thinking today I need to go to Dollar Tree or somewhere. I need to buy some baby socks because I want to work on a short regarding socks and stuff like that. And so sometimes I have to go out to the Goodwill and I'll pick up some baby things so that I can have things to wash or to do in my laundry labs. TJ, that's it. It's TJ. Duncan Party of Six is TJ. And Painted and Sprinkled is Kelly. 
Okay, let me make sure I got on my notes, John, because I have just been chattering, chattering, chattering. Okay. Well, let me get the notes back up and let's see if there's something that we need to get to that I have forgotten. I already asked you guys if you had a neat and organized space that cannot hold what it needs to. One of the other comments or concepts that he addressed was function, not aesthetics. He said, consider function and not aesthetics, meaning think about what is the use of the space? And not just how pretty you can make it. And I had to stop and think about that because I thought about my linen closet and I took some things out of it because I wanted to have less stuff in there. And I bought three cute little baskets and organized some of the towels and sheets in the baskets and this and that. And it just looks so cute. And then some of the towels and sheets that I took out, I'm like, well, where are these going to go? So I put them in a drawer in the guest room because I thought, well, I don't use them all the time. And I probably some of those don't only get used when guests are actually here. Um, I've got probably 10 or 12 sets of towels in the linen closet. And I've got three sets in the bathroom that my husband uses. So I'm like, that's enough towels for two people. But when we get company in and there's additional five or additional 10, then we do need all those towels. So, um, so I store some of them in another spot. But I thought about that because I thought, well, my linen closet is all cute and it's aesthetically pleasing, but function and it functions well if I don't have too much stuff in there. And let me make sure to talk about this since it just popped into my head, my laundry pantry. I wanted to buy some cute little bottles and just have all this really cute. Uh, visually pleasing things in my laundry pantry, have some of the bottles that were alike and have them cute little labels on them. And then I realized that that's not the right thing to do. You have to be concerned more about the function of the laundry pantry rather than the aesthetics of it. And you should not decant your bleach into those clear containers or dark containers with lids, with, you know, and put little labels and stuff on them. They need to stay in the container that they came in because that's what helps protect them better from the light and that kind of thing. And the instructions for um, use and then danger and stuff like that is on the packaging that it comes in. And also the packages that different things comes in many times are child protected or child proof. So aesthetically, it might look pretty to have all these cute little glass bottles and little um, decanters but it's not necessarily as functional because it could be a source of danger. So there's that to think about. Um, and then one of the things that I did do in that last video was when I cleaned out my utility drawer, which I also call my junk drawer, and I felt so much better cleaning it out. Now, when we talk about counting the cost of managing things, uh, let me see where that one is. Right here. Count the cost of the clutter. And you got to manage the item. I mentioned this in my video where I cleaned out my utility drawer or my junk drawer. And I mentioned in the video that in the 20 plus years that we lived in this house, no one has cleaned out that junk drawer but me. And I get so annoyed because no one else would clean it out. Now, when the kids were here, they didn't clean it out. Now it's me and the hubby. He didn't clean it out. And when I finally decided to clean it out, it was so messy. There was so much stuff in it. I'd have to shove it shut. Or if I was looking for a pen, I couldn't find it. And I just felt like sweeping everything out on the floor. Or we're not on the floor, but into the trash. And just managing the stuff and looking at the drawer made me annoyed because nobody else would help me with it. But once I got it cleaned out, I felt so much better. And that stress, that strain, it's gone. And every couple of weeks when I open the drawer to do this or that, I just kind of neaten it up just to kind of make sure it stays tidy. And I don't feel that stress. So that's something to think about.
Uh, Dali Zhu says, when her mama passed away, she tried to keep her stuff, and then she realized she can't keep everything. It was so overwhelming. She had to take many things to her relatives, to the village, and they treasured them. Yes, there are other people who will enjoy those things as well. Mm. So TJ is talking about giving... No, that's Sally. Sally's talking about donating things. She's talking to TJ and Blue Skies about donating things to women's shelters. And then um, Blue Skies is talking about giving away things from loved ones who's passed over. That can be very overwhelming, but take your time and you can give some of those to family members who may want them or you can donate them to places where they can still be treasured. Uh, Sally says she has a drawer that has some clothing that was her mom's favorites and her siblings went through the rest and they donated what they didn't want. That's good. Okay. Uh, so we got the function, not aesthetics. The other thing he did talk about was duplicates. If you have duplicates of things. So one of my problems is with the um, linen closet was that I had duplicates of sheets and towels, but those sheets and towels are, I managed to put them in another place because I do need them when I have company here. So that's just something to think about. Um, and for those of you that are just joining us, we're talking about whether or not you serve your house or your house serves you and the different little tips and tricks that you can use to make sure that it's a mutual situation or it's serving you and you're serving it lovingly. Now, one other thing which I thought was interesting was when he talked about pay attention to the areas of frequency that you have to clean. So what he means by that is that if there's one particular spot that you're always cleaning up, what's going on in that spot, in that space? Is it that it's too small, that there's too many things in it? So what's the problem with that particular place? And it could be that um, it's just not working and it needs to be reorganized. And I can relate to that when it comes to, I'll say, my kitchen pantry. I am always struggling with making sure that my kitchen pantry stays organized and decluttered. With two of us going in there, I typically know where most things are. But when, my, when the hubby goes in there looking for something, he's moving things all around, trying to find one particular thing. Then if he can't find it, he might pull some things out, gets what he wants, leave, leave and leaves it out, that kind of thing. Then I have to put things back. One of the things that I noticed he was always looking for was the jar of pecans. He uses the pecans in oatmeal, on ice cream, things like that. And so he was always looking for those. And then finally, I'd have to come and get them and find them for him. So I decided to change up the situation. I bought some ball jars that are stackable. I got them at Target. They're stackable. They have some little squat ones, and then they have some taller, a half gallon size ones. And I put the pecans in a in one of the little squat jars, and I set these jars out on my kitchen counter, and they look nice. And the half gallon jars that I had there with like flour and sugar, I put those in the pantry because I don't use some of those every day. And the other ones, these new jars that I put things in them that I would use frequently as well as put the pecans in a little squat jar. So now when he needs to find those things, it's right here on the counter. He can just see it, use it, close it back up, and it's no problem. So I realized, okay, if he can't find it, it's not working for him. Now, I'm not talking about the thing how you know men will do when they can't find anything and you have to come and get it for them. It wasn't, it's not that. But he struggled with finding some things and that was one of them. So I thought this way, now there's no trouble. And he's loving the fact that it's out on the counter and he doesn't have to look for it. Bye, Kelly. Good to have you here. Okay.
And then, of course, there's a 15 minute tidy up that you can do every evening. So now let's talk a little bit about spring cleaning real quick. And because uh, we've been on for a little over an hour, so it's time for us to be trying to wrap this up. So let's talk about spring into clean. And spring into clean is a challenge that I'm going to be doing uh, this spring. Today is March 1st. So and you know, spring start this month and spring cleaning. People start thinking about it during the month of March. So um, I'm going to encourage you guys to join me in the spring into clean decluttering challenge where we do some weekly decluttering and we're going to start out by focusing on the hidden spaces in the kitchen and if your laundry pantry is in the kitchen then that counts as in the kitchen so you could work on that as well but what i want you to do is choose four 15 minute tasks in your kitchen or your pant laundry pantry to work on and report back next week and let me know how you did now jerry since you just moved into a new apartment that's smaller you might decide you know what it's not the kitchen that i need to work on maybe you need to work in another area and so you can choose to do that but let's Let's kind of challenge each other to get started on our spring cleaning. Now, since I do the fly lady cleaning process and I'm deep cleaning every week, I don't need to do spring cleaning per se. But there are seasonal items that I only do seasonally, like wash the windows inside and out. Once the weather warms up, my husband and I will wash the windows inside and out. But Especially when spring starts, you get the windows up, you start to air the house out and you get the windows washed and then we might do it twice during the summer and then we don't do it again once the house gets closed up. So there's that to think about seasonal items. Maybe there are certain times of the year that people might flip their mattress or we clean our garage every spring. Even though we clean it every year, it's like the little minions keep getting tracked me back in there and he's probably going to get his boat out of storage in the next few weeks. So today was the first day he went out and started filling in the garage. He's going to start kind of getting things organized to get ready to bring the boat back home. And there's lots of stuff out there, fishing stuff and other stuff. So there's that to think about. So I wanted to ask you, what do you plan to do about spring cleaning? Typically, like I said, I don't spring clean per se. But I do have seasonal items that I take care of and I do my deep cleaning all year long with my zone work so I don't necessarily need to spring clean. But some people still like to do that. And one of the reasons for that is because, you know, back in the old days when people's houses were all shut up and they used coal for fuel, by the time uh, spring came, um, the houses, the walls would be all dark and dirty from the uh, coal. Um, dust being on the walls and stuff like that and sometimes it'd be a real stuffy odor in the house and they'd have to take the furniture out the mattresses out and put the sheets and things out on the line to air them out so there was a reason why people did spring cleaning but we don't have to do it like that anymore because we don't have some of those issues but we still do have our house closed up over winter and we want to get things aired out so there's that to consider So tell me in the chat if you're live or tell me on the replay if you're or tell me in the comments if you're on the replay. What are your plans for spring cleaning? And will you join me in the spring into clean where we're going to do some weekly decluttering starting the hidden spaces in our kitchen? Now, why do we want to start in the hidden spaces? Well, we start in those hidden spaces because if there's things that's cluttering up the kitchen that's on the counter and stuff like that. They might be out there because there's no place to put them. So once we get the hidden spaces, the cabinets, the bins, the pantries in the kitchen decluttered, that may give us space to put the things in that is out on the counter so that the pantry and those other cabinets can serve us better. Okay, so let me see what people are saying over here. All right, so Jerry says she's in. Blue Sky says she's in. Michelle says she needs this challenge. Uh, TJ says she's in. 
And Joe says she deep cleans regularly, so she doesn't ever have a huge project. I understand. I deep clean regularly too, but trust me, I can find some things that need doing in my kitchen. So Deb says she struggles to let items that she struggles to let go. She writes down on a three by five card and she writes the history and why she treasures it. Oh, what a nice idea. And then she puts them in a box and at Christmas time, she will give them to the kids. That way they can either keep it or donate it. I agree and I get it. I mailed a bunch of stuff to my son, my youngest son and my older one. Something I mailed them some stuff, but my youngest one, we have this box of some of the stuff that he had from either high school or from college. And it was like memorabilia, keepsakes and things like that. But I'm like, why are we storing this here? He's got a big old house bigger than ours. So I packed some of the stuff up and mailed it to him. And this way he can decide how he wants to manage it. So Deb says she'll also take a photo of the item and keep the and the card to keep as a special memory. Heather loves it when the windows are clean. Okay. Garden girl, fun trivia. Thank you. So uh, TJ will go through all the kids' clothes, husband and her work on the yard, the deck, and the patio. They don't even want to talk about the garage. Oh, I get it. Trust me, I get it. So M.T. Gilmore, uh, M.T., what's your name? The M.T. Gilmore fam. Spring clean. She's going to wipe down kitchen cabinets and wash the couch covers. Oh, I could, I see that. Now, my kitchen cabinets, I did a few, a couple of months ago. But, you know, kitchen cabinets always get sticky from where your hands grab handles, not to mention frying foods and stuff like that, just from being in the kitchen and grubbiness of fingers. So I have to do those every few months. Baseboards. And that is something I do neglect is baseboards. I will often get to those in the spring. Yeah, uh, Terry, I like to not. That's not the one I meant. Heather, she likes to get her carpets clean. I like to get the carpets cleaned a couple times a year, too. So that's something we need to get done. So Nefertiri says she's currently spring cleaning, but as a fly baby, it's not overwhelming. Exactly. When you are a fly baby, you're working the fly lady process. It's really not overwhelming at all. You pick your four things that you're going to deep clean and you do those four things in your week. Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, and you're good. Or you do those four things Saturday morning for one hour and you're done. Hey, Crafty Scorpio, how you doing? Um, she says, dust the ceiling fans and light fixtures. Uh, Nita B, carpet cleaning, floor and baseboard cleaning. She's in. All right. MT Gilmore, Angie. Hey, Angie. Good to have you with us. I'm glad you joined us tonight. So, okay, so we've got several people that have said they want to join us on um, our spring in the clean. So we're going to start on hidden spaces in the kitchen. But if you don't have any decluttering to do, you don't have any hidden spaces to do, then go right ahead and get your deep cleaning started. And uh, report back next week and let me know how things are going. Hey, I'm looking forward to that. That should be fun. Um and then I want to remind you guys, my Homemaking 201, Mastering Your Homemaking Journey, the cart for that is open. It'll make great gift for your young homemakers, new brides, and even for seasoned homemakers who need some tweaking. We've also got some new pieces in Apron Diva for spring and Easter, and then our spring into a uh, clean declutter decluttering challenge. And the question of the day we've been talking about all day was whether or not your house serves you or do you serve it? What's your aha moment? Is there something you're going to do differently? Let me know. And then please, you guys help me out here. Watch my 15 minute kitchen cleaning marathon. Now, several people have asked that they wanted to see longer cleaning sessions. So I stitched five cleaning sessions together. So it's about an hour and a half. But. You can put it on while you're working, cooking or whatever, and just kind of you can be getting some work done while I'm getting some work done. So when you guys are working on your uh, decluttering, put that on if you don't mind and we can kind of work together. And then also, I want you to watch my shorts and let me know what you think. I've been trying to do shorts on homemaking, 
cooking, and then laundry tips. You guys know I love laundry. So I've been doing shorts on all these things, though, related to homemaking. And I want to know which ones you guys are liking the best. And they're all less than 60 seconds. So let me know that, too. Um. Oh. Oh, Garden Girl says she's a fly baby backslider. She'll join the challenge. Hey, you know what, Garden Girl? Step back in your routine or check out Fly Lady Cat. She got she's got some videos to kind of help you get back on track, but you can get back on track here with us as well. And um Lane is gonna be moving, so she's going to clean everything and then pack it up. Okay. You're going to have to clean and pack it up. That's a good way to do it, too. But here's a tip. Declutter before you pack it up. Because what you don't want to do is move into your new space and then have stuff that you have to discard again. So declutter before you pack it up. Uh, Angie says that um, my shorts are helpful. Thank you. And Michelle says she likes some of their little visits with, oh, <laughs> when I'm popping in to say hi. You know, guys, I've decided I really want to try to get to 75,000 um, subscribers um, by the end of the year. I would love to get to 100,000 by the end of the year, but I know that's probably not realistic. But if I could get to 75,000 subscribers by the end of the year, and then 100,000 next year because I want my um, silver play button. So I'm going all in on shorts because shorts are, are really supposed to help you get more subscribers. And so my goal is to do shorts on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. Just little short, little, little puff things. And we'll see how they do. And they are helping me get more subscribers. So we'll see. Uh so, all right. Well, ladies and gents, I want to thank you guys so much for joining me. I appreciate it. And we've been on here for a while. So I will see you guys next week. Same time, same station. Good night. And thank you for joining me. I appreciate it.